Wiper, that guy is arguably the strongest top laner in the Oceanic region. He's such a wonderful player, Swiper, just because he can roll with the meta picks, you know, he can play whatever's in. He's always sourcing information from the LCK, from other regions, trying to work out what he should be playing. But you know if he gets that chance to bring out that Trindamir, oh, he's so yeah. known for that champion. If he ever gets the chance to bring out, if it ever fits the comp, he'll be the first one putting up his hand saying, man, I want to bring out Trindamir here. So anything could really come out of the top lane. That's, that's the excitement of a player like that who has his meta picks, but also has some of those pocket picks to make it really exciting. We can see that actually getting demonstrated in the champion select here. Swiper's Aurelia is going to be banned away, as well as Lissandra, which he has been picking up there in that top lane as well. Kassan and Anar off the board as well, so arguably 100% top lane bans. And of course there are some flex picks there. Yep. Uh, we've seen the Kassan and Lissandra in both lanes over in other leagues, so there's plenty of flexibility. And this, this, this third ban here, on the legacy side, it's probably a jungle ban, but still, we've seen Jarvan all over the place as yeah, well. There's so true. many flexible champions in League of Legends right now that we do see a lot of the target bans targeting this flexibility just so that people have a bit more of an idea when the picks come in where they're going. Yeah, exactly. And we're talking about picks, and Kadrid instantly locks in the Rex. I, of course, this is 5.2. She's taken a little bit of a hit, but still an incredibly strong jungler at this point. We'll see what the Chiefs have to answer for it. And to confirm that fact, it is 5.2, as you say, the live patch at the present. Yep. The only uh, champion rework is the Tristana rework. So Tristana is globally banned for this this particular day of competition, but Ari is available. The Ari changes have come through. I'd be surprised if we don't see an Ari in this, uh, this drop. Yeah, has actually slipped through the ban phase as well, and I was sort of expecting that one to be snapped up relatively quickly. We are into the third round, and Swiper's locked in that Scion potentially for the top lane, or the jungle there if Spooks wants to pick that one up. Of course, Spooks with a gigantic champion pool. This guy plays all sorts of things. I heard rumors of Karma jungles and things like this. It's just ridiculous, but Sivir being taken as well by Radio first up, and Sivir's Seen a lot of success. She's definitely been fantastic as far as the engagers are concerned. But do you think that this is counterpickable? I mean, we've seen kind of the Jinx counterpick coming up against Sivir. Caitlyn's also a really strong pick there. There's always options, but Sivir has so much utility oh my that even goodness. if the laning phase doesn't go well, and I know what you're referring to here, but even if the laning phase doesn't go well, Sivir has that utility. But the really interesting flavor of counterpicks come up. The latest marksman, the latest AD carry, Callista's been locked in on Legacy's side. Yeah, and Tallywack are going to be taking that one into the bottom lane, and I have heard tell that he is one of the, the Oceanic AD carry players that has picked up Callista. I'm so glad that he, we're going to see it here for our game against the Chiefs of all teams. So all on the line and going for arguably a newer AD carry pick. I mean, Callista's one of those champions whose ceiling is right up there. It's a bit like when Vayne was first released and people were working out what build to go with her, what skills to max. Callista, I mean, that passive... Oh, it yeah. just warps League of Legends because any champion without like a repeat gap closes really struggles to close distance. Obviously, Scion's going to come in fast. He's such a fast person with his ultimate, with that on the hunt as well. Yeah. The engage will be strong there, but once Callista starts jumping, starts getting those auto attacks off, going to struggle to lock down this Callista pick. And I'm, I find it really intelligent as we look over to the other side of the draft here. The Chiefs, Swiffer and Radio have locked in Lee Sin and Morgana, so they left that mid lane pick open for um, Swiffer to counterpick that lane if he wants to, of course. Lee Sin being locked in for Spooks. Spooks, an incredible Lee Sin player. Historically has done incredible things on that champion. And Rosie deciding to go with the Morgana. Always does like those casters. Played a lot of mid lane, of course, as well. And Legacy, we'll see what they respond with to this comp and see what they do to actually round out what they have. Hovering a Hecarim, but I don't know whether that's exactly going to get locked in. So the Lulu's already come through here. Could easily be a Lulu middle top. Yeah. Uh, the Lulu support's really actually the role that's fallen off the most when it comes to Lulu, because we've seen plenty of Lulu over in the LPL in those protector comps. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Lulu mid come out here, but I guess what's interesting to me is there's no one right now on the Chiefs team that can really get on top of Callista and explore. There's not the flavor of Zed right here, so I'd be surprised if we didn't see a real engaged mid laner coming out here. I mean, maybe not Fizz. Fizz, of course, saw some massive nerfs in this yep. patch, so it probably isn't going to be selected right here. And there's the lock. It's an insta Waste lock. Waste no time, does Rosie, and locks that one in for Swiffer. So Ari going to be played in the mid lane here against, well, we'll see what's going to be picked up because Cardred's now hovering the horse. Rek'Sai in the jungle. Rek'Sai can be seen see play in the um, in uh, the top lane as well, but it is going to be Choo Choo's on that Lulu in the mid lane. So anti-assassin, do you reckon that's going to work out here against this Ari? Uh, it's an interesting flavor. I mean, Ari against Lulu is going to be a lot of wave clear, right? It's going to be a very safe laning phase. That's why you see Lulu pick so much right now, is that even against the LeBlancs of the world, such a laning, safe laning phase coming out for Lulu. 
This RE change has made us such a handful though. The, the change on the Q, the movement speed, it's interesting that an offensive ability gives us so much defensive potential. Yeah. Because at any point, you can throw out that ability, dodge a skill shot with the massive burst in movement speed, and really be so maneuverable pre-6 that then we all know that once you hit 6, the jungler looks in mid lane's like, nah, mate, maybe not. Maybe not with the ganks mid. So, so maneuverable. That's why we've seen a huge rise in her win rate in solo queue as well. She's very powerful. This is the first time we're going to see her out on 5.2, which is super exciting. But, I mean, it's it's just super interesting for me all across the board here. Because, of course, we haven't even talked about the Hecarim top. Yeah, From exactly. what I understand, very much an Oceanic flavor pick in solo queue now coming out in competitive. Yeah, and we'll see what Kadra can do. Of course, we haven't seen Kadra in the top lane almost ever, especially not in competitive play here. So we'll see what Kadra does do with the horse up there in the top side of the map. But if there is an oceanic flavor, and we, we're looking at, at Keen here, who did, of course, head over to join the ranks of Curse Academy, now Gravity, that he busted out that uh, Hecarim in the mid lane. And of course, it's just an oceanic thing to just use the horse in interesting ways. And one of the reasons why we've seen it jump up a little bit is the changes, I believe, in 5.1, where they increased the healing cap mm. on monsters and minions. and made lane Hecarim really immovable you know once ever, whenever that w cooldown is up you can heal so much in lane the lane sustain is so incredible that it's actually very viable in a solo lane and hecarim scales so well with items that he can't get in the jungle you can't realistically rush a trinity force hecarim in the jungle because you're too squishy you blow up in a team fight you don't yeah. perform that role but in the top lane if you can really get going in the top lane specifically in a 1v1 matchup maybe you want to avoid the lane swap just because you're such a fiercely melee champion but if you can get that farm going Maybe even in the later game when the lanes, laning phase ends and you start to pick up that farm, have that teleport available. Hecarim scales so well with items. That's why we start to see her coming up, him coming up more and more. Yeah, and there's also the, the threat of incredible high damage Hecarim home guard teleport ganks as well. Uses that teleport to great effect as Hecarim and we'll see whether we see an incredibly speedy horse launching into the back of a fight. And I guess the most exciting thing about this matchup, there's so many excitements across the board. We probably said that word too much already. <laughs> is the fact that we had that role swap. We've got Taliwaka Ryan D. We've got Kadrid on top lane. And both of them picking up something new. It's not the old meta here whatsoever. It's Callisto starting to see that play in the LCS, starting to see that play across the world, but still largely untested. You know, her, her cap, her timings, you know, whether she's a late game champion or fiercely mid game champion, none of that's really decided yet. Everyone knows that she has strengths and they're trying to test the limits there. And Hecarim top much the same. So seeing all that potential from these, these roster swaps here, I feel like we'll have a better idea of what Legacy is all about by the end of this game. Yeah, and I want to have a look at the bottom lane just quickly here because Radir has locked in the Civ. I haven't seen him on that champion all that much recently, but if we go back to the Autumn round of eight, he played almost 90% uh, Civ in that tournament. They were picking it all the time. Of course, she was quite strong back then. I think it was just after she went through a little bit of a rework and... He's going to feel very comfortable down here, but we'll see whether he's going to be able to fall back into that comfort that he showed in, in Autumn. He, he basically, Sivir really here, Radio really needs his mates to get on top of Callista right here and get her out of a fight because they're going to really struggle yeah. after the first gap closes are used to get on top of that champion. If she's free hitting at the back, you know, whether it's the Hurricane build, whether it's the Blade of the Ruin King build, those are the, kind of the two flavors of Callista we've been seeing. If she's free hitting at the back, they're going to find it so hard after the initial gap close to be able to get on top of her. So I really need to use that on the hunt smartly or they're going to struggle here. But the Ari, I mean, we know how strong this Ari is on this patch. Yeah. That's the best chance. That's the thing. But is it going to be too hard for um, Swiffer to hit all those skill shots on this Trixie Callista launching herself all around this one? Or is that just discounting Swiffer's incredible skill in this champion? I mean, Swiffer is an Ari main from a long time ago. When he entered the scene, he was an Ari main. That was years ago. He's still a wonderful Ari player with the bus. You know he wants to break it out. And we're going to see him on the Rift very soon. Yeah, let's hop onto the Rift now, ladies and gentlemen, with Legacy taking on the Chiefs. This time, Legacy are going to be on our blue side and the Chiefs on the red. And we'll see exactly how our first match of the OPL is going to pan out. All right, so we're looking down the items here. Expect a pretty defensive fan right here. Of course, this is the first game of the OPL, the first game of this new league system for Oceania. So I expect kind of a defensive start just towards down. Just a bit of feeling out process. We might even see a longer laning phase than we've seen in competitive recently just because both these teams kind of want to feel each other out. And then by the end game, we're going to see some crazy team fights. I think we'll definitely be seeing some crazy team fights. Of course, the Chiefs renowned for such incredible team fighting synergy often leaving Radio on his own. Rosie loves to get up amongst it. And now he's on Morgana as well, so getting those Soul Shackles out is going to require him to be right in there. We'll see whether they do do that. Of course, 
radiant, fantastic, self-sufficient AD carry. And the Sivir, of course, affords that, even though she doesn't have a gap closer. She has the spell shield, has a fairly safe laning phase right here. And you look down the Chiefs lineup right here, it's the mid game where they're really going to shine. They have so much pick potential, so much skirmish potential. There's hardly a 2v2 across the lanes that you don't expect to see the Chiefs winning out on. So I expect to see Spooks really aggressive, really active oh, yeah. in the mid game right there, taking advantage of the charm, taking advantage of all the CC that Scion provides. In the bot lane, we have the Dark Binding coming out from Rosie. They have a lot of tools to assist a gank but in the sheer late game once this Hecarim and Rek'Sai get really really big that's where the Chiefs comp starts to fall away so I want to see the Chiefs focus on the mid game focus on that early time and focus on picking up those dragons because if they don't if we see the neutrals coming through for legacy in the early to mid game they're going to struggle in the late game the Chiefs yeah, and expect to see Spooks set up shop here in the mid lane as well Spooks and Swiffer have been playing together for a very very long time and you often see Spooks hanging around that mid lane as Swipe is just going to die to uh, the golems. Yeah, so off camera, we, we see him die. That's a very good strategy. He's going to spawn at level two. We saw Balls doing this in the LCS. So it's a nice little trick right there. Of course, no global gold afforded to the enemy team on that execute. And just lane level two. Yep. Hops in there and Kaldra's like, oh, oh, there he is. Okay, and now I have to deal with a level two Scion. He's going to lumberjack his way into my lane, but... I think that this could be a little bit of a smack fest up here in the top side. Not since the Revive Smite uh, Evelyn play of many moons ago <laughs> in the jungle have we seen the, uh, the executes at level 1. But it adds a nice little unique flavor. And of course Legacy and Kaldra understand you've got to push in, try to deny MCS. But it's very hard at level 1 for a Hecarim to AoE push down a wave. So largely unpunished this swipe, but he should have a significant experience advantage as this laning phase goes on. Yeah, and Spook's relatively healthy here in the jungle as he's going to clear out his second buff. And we'll see whether he decides to head back, maybe pick up his jungle item, or whether he's going to start affecting the map. And it looks to me like he's heading towards his top side, and Kadra might have to be a little bit careful up here. Oh, Sonic Rate Wave just going to miss as Kadra's going to pop that speed up and have a bit of a giggle. Still fairly Swiper maneuverable just, is that Hecarim. Yeah, and Swiper's just clearing out the creeps. It's buddy, it's back off. It's fine. We're just going to hit each other a bit. And the bot lane here. It's very interesting to see Chiefs so aggressively pushed in right here. Of course, no AoE wave clear on either Tallywack or, or Egym. So I'm surprised that Sivir's allowed herself to be pushed in. Maybe afraid of jungle pressure, but this is a lane matchup where I'd expect Sivir to push in, try and deny and get auto attack harass on the Callista under turret. But so far, Raiders actually played this laning phase very passively. It hasn't really been using that uh, ricochet in order to push the lane. You can see, oh, that rend. Beautiful spell shield, though, from Radiant in order to stop a lot of that damage. Starting to see the first jungle bias coming out here. We do see the Chilling Smite and the Pink Ward available from Lee Sin. So Spook's definitely going to start to get those wards down. It's what we said that Chiefs need to do in the mid game is to deny vision and set up picks and a Pink Ward. It's a good start. Certainly is. As we saw, Carbon actually doing a bit of counter jungling here early on. He's going to... I believe deny that wolf camp. And Rek'Sai, we haven't seen too much because she's been sitting on the ban list almost consistently at this stage. As Spook's going to clear out that one lonely little wolf. We've actually been pat uh, playing on patch 5 uh, in terms of casting for the last couple of weeks. So we're jumping to 5.2. Definitely a couple of rounds of nerfs coming onto Rek'Sai right here. So she's a little bit less power, especially in terms of early dueling. She yep. still gets very strong in the late game. But if you poke your head at level 3 or 4 at half health, you're really going to struggle to out-duel a Lee Sin especially. And Lee Sin is the duelist jungler. They are picking for the mid-game here. But Spooks really needs to double down and get something going. Or as we've explained a few times already, the scaling issue will start to show for Chiefs. So I, I need to see the pink wards and especially the first dragon coming down for Chiefs here. Yeah, and there's a lot of this going to be reliant on Choo Choo's here in the mid lane stopping that snowball from starting because of course very defensive is Lulu can really use that wild growth in order to stop these skirmishes from going in the wrong directions and is a lot of this on Choo Choo's for this mid stage? I mean you look down the lanes here Sion is going to outpush Hecarim early that's just the way that matchup works it's at least until level 9 and Hecarim gets 5 points in his Q in the mid lane Ari is going to outpush Lulu Lulu's going to do her best to match CS it's probably going to be an even CS wash in the mid lane, but it's down the bottom lane where I'd expect a significant advantage to come in for Sivir just because of her AoE clear. We finally see Radia has pushed that bottom lane into the turret, is getting some harass in right here. There needs to be at least a 10 to 15 CS advantage in the bottom lane because Callista's a hyper carry. In the late game, she's so deadly and has so much mobility that for her to go even with Sivir in this matchup is actually a lane win for Taliwaka. 
And is it sort of purely from these uh, one to four stages, or is it going to be? A, is there going to be a point towards this mid game where Radia is really going to be able to sort of hard shove Tallywacker, and before he gets say that hurricane in, is that? sort of the time where it turns around? Yeah, we're not 100% set on whether it's going to be a Hurricane Calista. That has been Sneaky's build, and a lot of the American AD carries are focusing on the Hurricane. The Hurricane does give her counter-pushing, so maybe that is the clever pickup against Sivir, just to give her a bit more AoE wave clear. You're always going to get a rend reset when you have that Hurricane, because of course any minion dying triggers that instant refresh. We see a little bit of jostling between Carbon and Spooks, but interesting, Carbon's actually out-leveling Spooks at this point. Yeah, and managed to pick up the Scuttle Crab as well. Very important objective on the map. And the Smite War was won here by Rek'Sai. And Carbon, definitely a fantastic jungler. Plays a lot of the likes of Rengar here as well. So able to transition over to sort of an engage uh, jungler in Rek'Sai. So really looking comfortable so far, but we haven't seen too much. And we're going to see consistent scuffles across the games today for that early Scuttle Crab, just because if you look at it then, this is a point for any solo queue jungler out there, 85 gold for killing that objective once you pick up your jungle item is a massive boost in gold, and of course, it doesn't eat any of your stats, it doesn't auto-attack you back, you don't take any damage from it, and the 85 gold upside is massive. Oh yeah, Tallywack are just going to wait out that spell shield and then use that Ren to get a lot of damage here under radio. Of course, the infinite stacking of that skill is ridiculous if you get a few auto-attacks in. I mean, towards the late game, once, you know, 1.7, 1.8, 1 attack speed, Callista comes out. The amount of Dragon and Baron secure available between Callista's Rend and the Smite, I mean, you can basically take objectives freely from about 3,000 health with consistent DPS. Insane as Callista's neutral control. Yep, just ridiculous. And you can see as well that uh, Spear being used to great effect in order to push this one out. Dark Binding is going to go wide. Egem's taking a bit of damage here, but you can see Radia has been the focus of Legacy and Tallywacker really able to shove this one in. So you can tell from Spook's CS values here that he has been trying to focus on influencing lanes, but a lot of the gold actually between the teams is that difference in jungle CS right here. It's actually a 600 gold lead, which is massive, and the first gank might be up the top lane. Yeah, Carbon's discovered swipe. He's going to get knocked up by that Umbario. The Q's procking here as well, but it seems like Cardred's given up on the whole factor. His Swipe is just going to pop that ultimate and run incredibly fast back to his base. Swipe was just looking for an excuse to pop the ultimate defensively there. He thought, maybe Carbon will lose interest and I can hold on to that cooldown. It's about a two and a half minute cooldown at level one, so you want to hold on to it if possible, but in the end, forced to blow the ultimate. Yeah, and we do have Carbon actually heading into his jungle. Has a lot of tunnels set up, so he's going to be able to head back. Pick up that red buff for the second round as Spooks is going to find his way here to the mid side of the map, but... Not going to find too much because Swiffer is, of course, pushing this one out quite hard. 9 CS is the advantage here for Swiffer. It's not doing too, doing too badly, but it's been a very passive start to this game. And sort of out of nowhere, a 400 gold lead here for Legacy. And what is arguably a later game comp? Yeah, that was, as I said, mostly the, the, the extra uh, creep camps that Carbon's managed to pick up here. He's been focusing on farming but at the cost of nothing, because it hasn't been leased in really having a strong impact on the lanes. Radio taking a huge bit of actually had to flash in the bot lane. Yeah, very late spell shield there as well as Rosie's going to come in incredibly aggressively. There's the Soul Shackles to come down. Radius come in. Now there's the shield to come down, but is it going to be enough here? As Egypt's trying to turn this one around under Radio, the teleports are now finding their way in as Rosie's going to get healed up by Radio here as well. And now Swift has found his way in. Is the charm going to be there? There's the Spirit Rush, but takes a tower hit for it. And there's an arrow to the back as well. And the Chief's trying to make something happen, but they just can't find anything. 5v4 down the bot lane. Importantly, Carbon hasn't teleported. Didn't even have teleport available right there. And you saw kind of a preview of the problem that Chiefs are going to have in fight. Because once they use their first round of initiation CC, their ladder CC is really poor. They're not able to close the distance, get the strong CC, and pick anyone off right here. They really need ward coverage to get advantage. They might take the first dragon here, however. They are going to be able to secure that first dragon. Of course, Carbon not electing to go over the wall and try a, a Valiant Steel. Cardred is going to be pushing down this top wave. So first dragon is going to go to the Chiefs, but that scuffle looked like it could have gone anyone's way. And with a mid-game comp, has to be a little bit worrying here for the Chiefs. And we speculate that we're going to see the Trinity Force coming out of the Hecarim. It's confirmed with the item build here, but importantly, it doesn't have the Sheen available just yet. So he doesn't have quite the same turret pushing. He probably will sit down the turret. Oh, Egypt just gets caught out there in the bottom side of the map, but Carbon's coming around. The teleport to come through from Cardred here as well, and Radius is so low. There's the flash coming from Carbon, and Cardred picks up the kill. Yeah, no flash available for Radius. It will be a successful kill, taking down the turret and getting down a kill. The snowball is on from this Hecarim.
Yeah, but it was actually First Blood going to the Chiefs here as Ejim fell earlier on in that one. But with Radier down, you have to say that this is definitely working out very well for Legacy as Rosie might be caught out as Cardridge coming under that tower. Tallywhack is here as well. And Rosie, you're in so much trouble. And that's an easy kill there for Cardridge as Carbon sacrificing himself almost to that toe. Yeah, almost unfortunate jung jung juggling <laughs> coming out right there. Was able to get away. And then, of course, can ultimate to safety. Yeah, it just goes straight past Spooks, who can do nothing about it there as well. And Legacy looking fantastic so far in this game. And we talked about how they had kind of lane matchup advantages, Scion versus Hecarim, we focused on specifically here. This Hecarim's massive away. Trinity Force at 11 minutes, the most expensive item next to Infinity Edge, already completed. And this is kind of the worry. To get a Trinity Force from the jungle, we're talking 25 minutes, 28 minutes part-time, even if you're doing well. But to have that item so early, the damage is already coming through from Kadrid. Once he can supplement that with a bit of tankiness, this Hecarim is going to be almost immovable in fights. Yeah, we can see Swift is actually taking a lot of damage there in the mid lane as well. He's going to have to go back and grab some health and, of course, mana. A Swipe is going to feel like he's done some work there on the top side doing some damage to that tower. And 3,000 gold is what it's been stretched out to from that last scuffle on the side of Legacy. And they're doing well here on the early stages, but... Chiefs, they don't look like they've pulled the trigger necessarily yet. The Infinity Edge yet to come out from Radia here as well. We'll see whether they can turn this one around. Most of the gold is focused on the top lane here, of course, at 2-0. You do expect this Hecarim with 100% uh, of the kills of his team to be about 1,200 gold ahead of his opponent. But significantly, it's the secondary matchup here, the jungle matchup, Carbon versus Spooks. About 800 to 1,000 gold. Actually, 1,000 gold is the advantage for Carbon here. She's just focused on farming, has the Rek'Sai, and Spooks has never been able to have a situation where Swiffer was able to push out lane on Ari and then go and roam. With that Lulu pick, so much wave clear available, there hasn't been the Ari Lee Sin jungle invasion, the Ari Lee Sin roam, because it's been consistent wave clear from Choo Choo's. The Lulu pick here is really working dividends. Yeah, precisely. And sort of being a bit of an unsung hero here as Choo Choo, as, as he's just been clearing out waves, but it's done exactly what Legacy need, as you mentioned. And Reed is going to clear out this bottom side. Could be a little bit dangerous with that outer turret gone, but there is a bit of a 2v2 situation in the mid side. Top lane is getting a little bit lonely, I think. I mean, relieving pressure off the whole map is the Lulu pick right here, just because sitting in lane, farming up, instant wave clear, basically coming out of that AP Lulu. No space for the skirmish pick-based team to actually get those picks, even to get a vision advantage, because you usually need the two members to sweep brushes, deny vision, and put down new wards yourself. No ability whatsoever to get down deep vision. It is going to be two wards are available on the leasing right now. It's probably going to be a sightstone leasing eventually, but there's no aggressive wards coming down. There's just no tools for Chiefs right now to get a pick, to transfer that into an objective. And that just allows Legacy to scale up, get stronger, and they're going to get there. Yeah, Rosie's actually popped the Soul Shackles here as well. Carbon's got wild growth. He's huge in the backside, but Choo Choo's going down very, very low. Rosie picks up that kill. Tallywhack has found his way and gets stunned up by Swiper here. And look at that Orb of Deception damage as Tallywacker ults to try and get them back in. But it is going to be Swiffer picking up that kill. He's very low. Cardred gets charmed. The Foxfire here as well. Nice kick back into the tower and the Chiefs have turned it back on. The kick was wonderful there from Spooks. It actually got them the slight advantage right there. The team fighting was a bit scattered from both teams. So three for two, you'll take that from the Chiefs, but still a 2,000 gold lead for Legacy even after that trade. Yeah, clawing their way back up though are the Chiefs and with two of these towers down as well, do so we need to try and find some of those. So we jump to a replay. Look how fast Radia dies right here between the burst from Rek'Sai and of course Lulu's AP coming through here. Swiffer tries to get a counter kill, manages to assassinate Choo Choo's. So the mid lane has fallen right here, but so split are Chiefs right here. The Legacy are fighting together and Chiefs are super, super split. So for them to actually come out ahead here, it's just Kadra going a little bit too aggressive at the end right there. The kick was really smart. It was nice play right there. It's very slight advantage in that one skirmish, but this should have been a set of skirmishes in the first 15 minutes, snowballing a lead for the Chiefs. One dragon to show for the team comp they've picked and to be behind in gold is a really big problem for the Chiefs. Let's see whether they can change it up, of course. Looking a little bit better now after that last skirmish and probably feeling a little bit more confident at the same time, but they need to start taking down some of these structures. A lot of the ways that the Chiefs really solidified a lead historically has been by taking towers and then getting forward vision and then strangling their opponents out of resources. But at this stage, it's looking like it's going the opposite way. I mean, you're looking at one of the, if you look at one of the best teams in the world at executing a pick comp, you talk about the likes of OMG, 
getting that first rung of turrets down to get aggressive wards is their natural game plan. That's what Chiefs looked at here with the Siver pick. They haven't been able to execute it. Yeah, Dark it. Finding is going to land here, though, in the river. And Carbon's going down incredibly low. Spooks manages to get out. There's a Soul Shackles under three members here, as well as Rosie is going to lock everyone up. Swift is here now. And look at the damage from this Arya's Cardred flashes away. And perfect timing for that dragon. The moment that Carbon committed to taking that tunnel, sealed his death right there. He could not go back through the tunnel to get out. He was away from his team, was picked up, and finally that pick was almost gift-wrapped for the Chiefs right there. They got the pick, they pick up the second dragon. They're almost ahead in gold right here. It's very close. We're gonna see the Reaper here. Once he takes that tunnel, he's so split from the rest of his team. Both Tallywacker and Ejim have to disengage right there. So he's picked instantly right here. And it's so much easier to team fight when that huge Rek'Sai in the front lane is down. They pick up another two other exit kills right there fortuitously dragon spawns just at that point and now the first two dragons are for the chiefs yeah and Cardred is running really fast in the top side of the map here as well gonna get away from that dark binding but the chiefs looking brilliant and as you mentioned i mean these dragons aren't going to be showing up on the gold score so definitely giving chiefs an edge and it's all tied up it's one of those situations where the first dragon the six percent ad and ap of course that benefits you all throughout the game it multiplies your stats it makes you stronger at all points the second dragon, not as critical, but it of course gives you the timer and positioning for the third dragon, that big movement speed increase. You can see how much someone like Kadra is going to be looking for the 5% MS. Of course, double scaling on movement oh, speed yeah. is that Hecarim. And this is what we said. The win condition for Chiefs was to take down those neutrals in the mid game. So of course, they've succeeded with that. They've got those two neutrals. They've even managed to supplement that with some picks through that last team fight. So they're finally getting closer to the par time for... 17 minutes, but they're definitely not ahead and we know where this legacy comp is going We know what the late game looks like coming out from legacy and Tallywacker It was the blade of the Ruin King. He was actually sitting on vampiric scepter and two daggers Which of course is sneaky's build that he does transition to an early hurricane, but the complete item comes through Yes, yeah, swiper actually ulting in very deep here does get howling gale But he's taking no damage course, that frozen heart has come through legacy are now on the run as their tower is gonna fall down Ejim with a nice disengage monsoon and Chief's going to have to get out. Yeah, they get their first turret here, but it's only one turret with a Civicom. Even with all the mobility available from On The Hunt, they haven't been able to rotate and pick up the three turrets. Three turrets before 25 minutes, getting those aggressive wards in. That's what Chiefs are looking to do. But that's a start. The mid turret affords you the most vision. If you can ever take down a mid turret and exchange that for a top or bottom, you open up so much extra vision in terms of the creeps breaking in. You have extra entrances to go in and get those aggressive wards down. They'll feel great picking that up, but they need to not let it go. They need to get rotations going and get the structures in top and bot before the mid game ends. You can see here, Radio has definitely taken your message. He's gonna be trying to take down this bottom lane outer turret here as well. So they are gonna be able to secure that one. And it looks like the answer is going to be a hard push here in the mid lane. They do manage to get the outer turret, but can they disengage? Is that over deception doing so much damage? The flash into the resonating strike and Spooks manages to take down Tallywacker. He's trying to get out now as well. There's a stun onto Choo Choo's Wild Gross himself, but it's not enough. That is a double kill already. And then a last kill for Swiper as well. Beautiful play by the Chiefs. The pick's coming thick and fast for the Chiefs there. They'll get a second in a turret right here. They're feeling better. You see that Kaja was able to make the evasive maneuvers, get away quickly, but no real team fight influence from that horse. And the Chiefs are getting the min game and they're going strong. Yeah, and this is what the Chiefs are known for as well. It's just beautiful to see them back in these team fights where they have beautiful coordination, everyone on the same page. And Spooks hitting that sonic wave was just stunning. And it was just crucial that Radio was just rotating at that time after taking that bot turret right there. He was just there fortuitously in the mid lane for that fight, managed to clean up. The whole fight, Rosie was actually separated from his teammates on Morgana. Not a big problem, of course, because he could engage with that black shield, cause a lot of disruption in the back, and four for none is the trade. So really fantastic for the Chiefs, but... The thing that we have to mention, the thing that we have to go back to is the late game scaling comp coming out of Legacy. And if they can turn this one around, as we can see, the Hurricane has been started up by Tallywacker. I mean, there'll come a point once that Hurricane's completed where it's just really murder to get on top of that cluster. It's so hard to do because she has so many mini flashes, so much mobility coming from that passive that unless the Scion Ultimate hits, unless the Charm hits, or unless the Dark Binding hits, unless the big engage options hit, and you have to hope that Taliwak is able to dodge those with all the mill ability available and, of course, summon a flash. And even the Janna on top of it, the queen of disengage at her side. 
free hitting in a team fight, that ren damage adds up. You get so many resets with the Hurricane, because even if you execute a minion with that ability, you'll still be able to use it for damage on an enemy hero target as well. So if you can keep that cooldown going, rend after rend, you're going to wreck a team fight. See whether he can, but of course, Swiffer. We haven't mentioned too much. 4, 0, and 5 though now on this Ari, and he's looking brilliant, looking incredibly comfortable on this champion. As we've mentioned, Kadra going to try and clear out this top side, but this Ari has gotten going in the mid game, and we know how strong she is on this patch. It's definitely crept up quickly though, Atlas. There was a stage when he was just sitting in mid lane, clearing waves against this Lulu, but once the little skirmishes started happening, once the second dragon fight started, 4 0 5 and a death cap to show. Basically, they both have their core mana region items, but a death cap to show for that mid game snowball just means those are going to be some deadly charms. And of course, with this current patch here, the Foxfire damage comes out so instantly that that assassination burst potential you thought was removed with the DFG removal that, of course, was cemented this patch is in full effect on this Ari right now. Most definitely is. And we can see the Chiefs of old coming through here. Now that they've taken out a few of those outer turrets are going to be putting these wards all throughout Legacy's jungle. We can see they've ignored their own jungle almost entirely and the red dots throughout Legacy's areas definitely and penetrating this is what i thought the game would look like five minutes ago so you could say maybe the part time's a bit slow from the chiefs but the mid game's on they're in huge ascendancy here right now and it's up for them it's up to them to strangle legacy out of the resources they need to get this game to late game i think they can do it they have the proud history they're a very smart research team but they need to be proactive in this mid game this third dragon of course a wonderful objective to pick up yeah easily going to be able to take that one down it fell incredibly quickly and it looked like Legacy were looking to transition to some sort of Baron play, but it might just be that top in a turret. Yeah, Kadra is free hitting here. The whole team's rotating, but the rotation's on for Chiefs as well. We see the bat coming from EGM on our screen already. Yeah, the base race is not being called by Legacy as Kadra's going to head back as well. That Rampage stacking up. He does have a lot of damage on these turrets, but he's decided not to go back here. So that inhibitor turret is now under fire, and the Chiefs are the ones that are going to be turning around. You can see Legacy aren't completely committing to this push. We see Kadrid periodically canceling that teleport up top. They're not sure exactly. There hasn't been a decisive call from Legacy, and they're kind of happy to see Chiefs back away here as they don't have to make what could be a really difficult split call between having Kadrid keep pushing up the top and losing the minimum down bot or really pushing for the win. Yeah, but as you can see, it does give the Chiefs an opportunity to head back, pick up some items, and... Do you think it's now time to focus on this Baron? Do you think Baron is going to be what the Chiefs look at to really try and get into the base of Legacy? It's kind of an interesting situation with Baron just because a pick comp wants to pick up exclusive Dragon, uh, exclusive Dragon and Baron Vision and then get that first pick before they try going for that Baron. Just because if we see the, uh, the ultimate coming out from Hecarim on top of all the debuffs coming out in the AoE, from Legacy, it's going to be a lost Baron for them. Obviously, Kaju take a nice burst of damage in mid. So they'll want to bait it. They want to get that pick. They want that charm to land because all that damage oh, guaranteed yeah. coming out from Swiffer will be a, a quick pick right there. But they're not in a position to rush down the Baron. In fact, if any team has a Baron team, you have to say Callista is definitely the Baron champion if there ever was one. Most definitely. If she is able to get any of those auto attacks onto that Baron, there is almost no chance that the Chiefs will be able to steal that one away. But... In control of the map at this stage. On the hunt's actually being popped here as Swipe is going to try and ult in and get the stun. Tallywhack is going to get caught up as we check out Kadrid. And he's trying to dodge out of the way. The base gate's doing a lot of work here as well in order to keep him safe. But the boomerang's going to find its mark. The Chiefs, they've broken in. Swift is going to flash forward, actually, as Carbon's going to get the knockup. Swift is tanking this one out. Lands the charm here nicely, but Kadrid gets wild growth. He's going to be able to pick up that kill. And he's coming straight in here on this gigantic horse. Actually flashing out of his own base, interestingly enough. But work has been done here by Chiefs. We look down the Chiefs lineup, only two ranged auto attackers to assist Swiffer right here. So they can't take down the inhibitor, but it's a big pickup taking that inhibitor turret right there. Any successful pick at this point could be an inhibitor, could be Baron. They have options aplenty across the map here. An embarrassment of riches if they ever get down a pick. And so far, if we're watching the first 25 minutes, they've been very successful at taking a pick and turning it into an objective. Certainly have Legacy looking to make a move now that Swiffer has been taken off the board. Rosie's hanging around trying to be a ward, as it seems. Just going to watch the Raptors fall down, and Carbon's going to head back. As 
Wiper on defensive duties as well. So Legacy not really making any decisive moves around this map. And that's something that you did mention earlier on, is the fact that they haven't really been this, the team that we're used to seeing that are so confident in themselves and their calls. Well, we saw that first 10 minutes. We actually praised them for staying even in the lanes that should have potentially have snowballed thanks to Spook's early game pressure. Spook's was a bit off the board in terms of early pressure. But our legacy didn't pay for it. In fact, we saw the big snowball purchase, that very early Trinity force coming out from Cardrid. I thought that was going to be a really big factor in the mid game. But the, everybody else has been dying in these fights. We've seen so many 4 for 0, 4 for 1 trades. Cardrid able to get away is tanky, does do damage. But the rest of his team is falling around him. And that's kind of been the issue here, is that the picks have worked. And the, the, the snowboard Hecarim at this point in the game hasn't really amounted to much. No, it hasn't really worked out, and he still has a massive percentage of the team's kills. And unable to really do much with it. You can see as well, I mean, Choo Choo's, we did give him some uh, credit in the early game for how he played out this Lulu, but 0, 2, and 4, not quite having the game that he wants. And Ejim, the star player, arguably, for Legacy here. Fantastic supporters. Radio's actually going to pop on the hunt here as well. Tallywhacker, he's going to get caught out yet again and eliminated straight away. The Chiefs, this is not all they want as Ejim tries to use that monsoon. But look at the size of that crit. And Choo Choo's is going to die as well. The Chiefs easily pick up this inhibitor and only two alive, but I don't think they can do much. Atlas, I don't really understand why there's so many situations where the Chiefs are afforded vision of Taliwaka standing at the front. He's the most forward champion on his team, and all his tanks are taking jungle camps. They're away from the rest of his team. And if you allow, if you allow a team to run into a Callista, she's not even ha able to use her passive, not getting any autos in to get any sort of mobility. She's just gonna die for free. They need to understand that if they're not grouped here, if these two tanks, Carbon and Kardred, are not at the front, it's free food, it's free kills on this Taliwaka. And I think Legacy know that this Baron's going to be going down. They want to try and make something of it as Dragon's going to be up in a minute. But they don't have the timer, of course. The Chiefs have had that one on lockdown. The inner turret is now the call, but the Baron's going to fall down. The Chiefs now with complete control over this game. Yeah, they're going to get some little damage, little poke damage onto this inner turret right here. But you're correct, with that Baron buff especially, we're going to see emphatic pushes down the mid right here. And if history is any recreation for the last 28 minutes here, it's going to be a win for Chiefs. Yeah, there's the Onslaught of Shadows being used here by Cardrid. Spook's unable to catch up to that really fast horse, and Carbon just going to burrow his way out. But the Chiefs losing an inner turret and picking up a Baron, I'd probably take that if I was them. I mean, the bizarre thing to me is here, you look at the two frontliners, Cardrid and Carbon. Of course, they're going to have the AP Lulu coming in. They're going to have a massive HP stack. You'd think, all right, 4-1, 2-2. All the kills, in fact, on Legacy's side are on the frontliners. But the frontliners are never to be found whenever the rotations come in from Chiefs. Whenever they're popping the on the hunt, it's Tallywacker are basically dying instantly. And the tanks are sort of to the side or making evasive maneuvers right here. They're not fighting as a team. They're not grouping as a team especially. That might be the ward coverage that Chiefs have put down facilitating those picks. But I think some of the rotations and positioning from Legacy have been pretty off in this game. A little bit questionable, but on the hunt, plus the ult coming through from Swiper here on Sion, who just popped his Elixir of Ion. That's a really, really big Lumberjack coming through that bottom lane. He's actually going to pop that ult yet again. We'll see whether Tallywacker can get out of the way, but oh, he's trying to curl around. Doesn't manage to do the teleport to come through from Kadri. You can see this Sion is tanking up everything right now, and he's barely dying. Gets knocked up from the Wild Growth. I think he's going to die. Finally gets shut down here as the Orbit Deception comes through, and Swiper tries to beat everyone as he's Undying comes through, but Legacy hold off the Chiefs for now. For once they pay for an over-engage, but you just look down this Chiefs comp, you know what's going to happen. You're going to see the lane ganks coming in from Sion with that ultimate. On the hunt is going to be popped. I mean, look down at Rosie. Rosie gives the strategy away right here. He has the righteous glory oh, here. Yeah. This is just a linear engage, run straight at you comp right here. So what's the counter to that? What's the counter to knowing that your enemy is going to run in a straight line to you? It's disengage. It's having your tanks at the front. It's them eating the Scion ultimate. But Scion's been able to get to the back line with reckless abandon, which should never happen in a competitive game. Not to mention the fact that they have Ejim here with the monsoon, the, the queen of disengage in Janna as well at the same time. So... See whether they can turn it around. Of course, it's not too late here for Legacy, but with an inhibitor down, the Chiefs definitely have the control and with so much vision as well, forward vision on this map. Yeah, it's a lot of forward vision, as you mentioned, and not a lot of defensive vision, specifically pink wards. I actually only noticed one pink ward on the map from Legacy right here. They need to have safe areas where they can farm. They need safe access to their camps. If they don't have that, if they're willing to give up basically everything in their base, everything on their side of the neutrals, 
they're going to lose their game just because they're never going to be able to scale up to like this. this is a very strong Hecarim. A very damage build coming out from Carbon right here. So there is burst available between those two frontliners. They're tanky and do damage. Yeah. But they can't compare. Look at Swiffer right here. He's got an embarrassment of Rich. I'm pretty sure he's sitting on quite a big amount. 1,700 gold to complement the three big AP items right here. And it looks like it's going to let this turret fall. Yeah, you can see Radio just free hitting on that one. Nice spell shield to get out of the way of that tornado. And they easily take down this inhibitor turret. The inhibitor's taking fire here as well. Legacy have to engage onto something. Swipe is taking a lot of damage. Carbon gets caught up there as well, but he manages to make his way out. But Swiffer picks up the kill on Egypt. Raid here is trying to get rid of Kadra, but Spooks is there to help him out. Swiffer's now trying to deal with the horses. Swiper is somehow still not dead. Tallywhacker, though, this time getting caught up just a little bit, but is going to be safe. But the inhibitor goes down, and I don't know how Swiper survived for so long. Swiper is doing more tanking alone than Kadra and Carbon have managed this game. He's just running in, taking so much time. If you look down his items here, I mean, not an offensive item in sight whatsoever. So many resists being picked up. And he's so strong right here that Tallywhacker, we have to mention that Callista's damage comes on repeated orders. It comes on using that rend to execute, using that Blade of the Rune King to do percentage health damage, then executing after 20, 30 orders. That 20, 30 orders are hardly even scratching the Scion right oh, here. No. And we did see in that fight a little preview of what would have happened or, or maybe even a, a teaser of what would have happened in a different game because we finally saw Kadra get on top of Radia and Siv has never been a tank buster. She struggles with tanky men in front of her. That Hecarim is huge with the randoms. More tanky stats coming out. Uh, so Radia could do nothing. And if there was a different game where they had been able to get that crazy Kadra Carbon to engage onto, the, onto Radia right here, if Siva was falling or doing trivial damage in these fights, I think this would have been a legacy win. Could well have been, but now Swiper has a Thorn Mail. He's got three of the biggest armor items in the game. There is nothing that Cardred Carbon or Tallywhacker can do to this Scion at all. And Choo Choo's on this Lulu just doesn't have enough damage as a Lulu. And all Swiper realistically has to do is attack move on top of Tallywhacker, stay on top of him. Of course, the Frozen Heart is decreasing so much of the attack speed based Callista's damage right here. And the rest of the team is going to carry him. He doesn't need to do any damage. All he needs to do is stop Callista from free hitting. And there's no way she's going to be able to walk past this Scion and do damage to the back line. And you can see Radio walking up very far, getting those ricochets onto Carter, who doesn't take very much damage from it. And I think Legacy, they want to make a play here. As the Prey Seeker going to come through from Carbon. But you can see the Chief's just so strong right now. And Swipe is threatening that engage. So much space control coming out of a champion without even a lot of CC. Oh, the engage to come through from Carbon here just a little bit as Choo Choo's gets caught by a Dark Binding. There's the Onslaught of Shadows right in amongst it, but Kadra's getting torn apart. Swift is trying to come in. It's a nice monsoon from Egypt, getting a lot of healing done as well, but Kadra's going to fall down. The first one in the fight, and the Chiefs just never stop pushing. Really smart positioning coming out of the Chiefs right there. The only free auto target for Tallywhacker at any point in a team fight is Swiper, and good luck taking down that undead monster in the top lane oh, right yeah. here. He's eating, and there's no spread coming out. The The hurricane effect is not being felt right here just because there's nobody standing next to Swiper. He's just eating autos happily, and the rest of his team are just able to focus fire down. Kajit in the front tanked up a lot of damage. Carbon, importantly, was squishy there. He was actually forced out of the fight very early, so couldn't really commit to a front line. So it was a one-man front line versus another one-man front line. And I'm going to give it to the Scion every day of the week. Oh, yeah, especially considering the gigantic amount of armor that he's picked up against this largely AD-based team, as we mentioned before. Tallywhacker now trying to clear out these super creeps, those Wrens just building up massively. But I think this is where we're going to see Callista being tested as this late game carry. And can Tallywhacker really show the prowess that we've seen in other regions on this champion? I mean, the Scion pick was early here and it's paying off so much dividends because he's able to stack armor with Reckless Abandon. Because again, this is an AP Lulu right here. She does do little bursts of respectable damage, but she's never going to be able to DPS down the health pool of this Scion. Of course, Scion has so much health coming from his passive right there that he's happy with the magic damage that's coming through and he's not taking any physical damage whatsoever. He certainly isn't anymore either as the fifth dragon is picked up by the Chiefs. Kadra may be in a little bit of tr trouble as Rosie was looking for a possible over-the-wall move, but the Baron is going to be the next one, and it looks like tutorial style for the Chiefs as they take a couple of inhibs, take every neutral objective, and then move in to finish the game. I wouldn't be surprised if they went top lane, Papa Smithy. There's no rush, and it's a bit of feeling. There's a lot of feeling about this matchup, and it's going to be a very nice start to the OPL for the Chiefs right here to finally get one of those monkeys off their back because it's been oh, such yeah. a consistent legacy stranglehold, both at winter, both at finals. Okay, this is just the start of a league, but it's just the start the Chiefs are looking for. 
precisely it. And we'll see whether they can continue this one as the league shakes up. Of course, these two teams are going to be seeing each other another, another time, of course, on dif different sides of the rift. And if the Chiefs can come through this matchup, especially in a 2-0 fashion, you could imagine that they're feeling fantastic heading into the final. As Kadri coming in for an onslaught, but he's going to get half his health taken off him. Carbon's getting destroyed in the back line. Swiper locks up four members at once. The Monsoon's decent, but Egypt's going to die. Everyone's dying. Triple kill now for Swiffer. The tower goes down, but the Chiefs, they just want to finish off the base, and what a dominating performance. Swiper has no cares whatsoever from these beams coming out from the Nexus turrets right here. Tanky in the front, so much consistent damage coming out from Swiffer. 11, 1, and 8 on that Ari. There's a reason we've all been talking about Ari on this 5.2. And now we're going to start all talking about the Chiefs because they've come up with a massive win here over their nemesis, over Legacy. What a beautiful victory as well. And I think that Swiffer's Ari is never going to see play again. I mean, until she gets changed... It's just too much. This guy is too strong. And we just saw in that last fight, he was tearing people apart. I mean, you buff a champion that someone has been consistently playing for years now. This is the result you're going to get. And it was left open. He even had the chance to pick it at fifth pick right there. Yeah. Ari's safe in almost every matchup. But to actually have it in a favorable matchup, or at least an even matchup, with the power level of that champion, Swiffer showed why he should not do that. And we're going to get a replay to really get... Another cementing of the flavor of this game. So it's quite early here, so it's only 7-4. to four. The gold's actually quite even, and we complimented Legacy. We said they played this early game out really well, and we were kind of questioning why Spooks hadn't been more proactive on the Lee Sin. We're going to see a fight. We'll roll the tape right here. So Legacy are actually being aggressive and pushing in. This is the situation where Morgana, you can see on the minimap, has actually found herself in a really aggressive position right here. The Q onto Taliwaka won them this fight because instantly exploded was the the Callista right there. And you can see Chiefs are fighting as a team. Three members, the target selection. You saw the veteran status of the Chiefs right there, able to call out targets well. Once Taliwaka fell, come on, that was a wonderful oh, piece yeah. of individual skill from Spooks. But once he fell, the play calling, the experience, it all came through. And that's kind of what we saw from the Chiefs right there. They played to their strengths. They got those picks. It was a little bit shaky in the early game. But what a crazy mid and late game from the Chiefs. Yeah, that was a fantastic match. But we still do have more to come, ladies and gentlemen, as next up, it's going to be Fournot taking on Legacy. And we'll see whether Legacy can bounce back after that tough defeat.